The Production of Space by Henri Lefebvre, page 190-203. 7. A social space is not a socialized space. The would-be general theory of the socialization of whatever precedes society, i.e. nature, biology, physiology, needs, physical life, and so on, is really just the basic tenet of an ideology. It is also a reactive mirage effect. To hold, for example, that natural space, the space described by the geographer, existed as such and was then at some point socialized, leads either to the ideological posture of nostalgic regret for a space that is no longer, or else to the equally ideological view that this space is of no consequence because it is disappearing. In reality, whenever a society undergoes a transformation, the materials used in the process derive from another historically or developmentally anterior social practice. A purely natural or original state of affairs is nowhere to be found. Hence, the notoriously difficult problems encountered by philosophical thinking on the subject of origins. The notion of a space which is at first empty, but is later filled by a social life and modified by it, also depends on the, this hypothetical initial purity, identified as nature, and as a sort of ground zero of human reality. Empty space, in the sense of a mental and social void which facilitates the socialization of not yet social realms, is actually merely a representation of space. Space is conceived of as being transformed into lived experience by a social subject and is governed by determinants which may be practical, work, play, or bio biosocial, young people, children, women, active people, in character. This representation subtends the notion of a space in which the interested parties, individuals or groups, supposedly dwell and have their being. Of any actual historically generated space, however, it would be more accurate to say that it played a socializing role by means of a multiplicity of networks than that it was itself socialized. Can the space of work, for example, when indeed it is legitimate to speak of such a space, be envisaged as a void occupied by an entity called work? Clearly not. It is produced within the framework of a global society and in accordance with that society's constitutive production relations. In capitalist society, the space of work consists of production units, businesses, farms, offices, the various networks which link these units are also part of the space of work. As for the agencies that govern these networks, they are not identical with those that govern work itself, but they are articulated with them in a relatively coherent manner which does not, however, exclude conflicts and contradictions. The space of work is thus the result, in the first place, of the repetitive gestures and serial actions of productive labor, but also, and increasingly, of the technical and social division of labor. The result, therefore, too, of the operation of markets, local, national, and worldwide, and lastly of property relationships, the owner and management of the means of production. Which is to say that the space of work has contours and boundaries only for and through a thought which abstracts, as one network among others, as one space among many interpreting spaces, its existence is strictly relative. Social space can never escape its basic duality, even though triadic determining factors may sometimes override and incorporate its binary or dual nature, for the way in which it presents itself and the ways in which it is represented are different. Is not social space always, and simultaneously, both a field of action, offering its extension to the deployment of projects and practical intentions, and a basis of action, a set of places whence energies derive and whither energies are directed? Is it not at once actual, given, and potential, locus of possibilities? Is it not at once quantitative, measurable by means of units of measurement, and qualitative, as concrete extension where unreplenished energies run out, where distance is measured in terms of fatigue or in terms of time needed for activity? And is it not at once a collection of materials, objects, things, and an ensemble of materiel, tools, and the procedures necessary to make efficient use of tools and of things in general? Space appears as a realm of objectivity, yet it exists in a social sense only for activity, for, and by virtue of, walking or riding on horseback or traveling by car, boat, train, plane, or some other means. In one sense, then, space proposes homologous paths to choose from, while in another sense it invests particular paths with special value. The same goes for angles and turns. What is to the left may also be sinister, what is to the right may also be right in the sense of rectitude. 
it would be homogeneous space, open to whatever actions may be reasonable, authorized, or ordered, can, under its other aspect, take responsibility for prohibitions, embody occult traits, and bestow favor or disfavor upon individuals and the groups to which they belong. Localization is answered by divergence, and focus on a central point is answered by radiation, by influx and diffusion. Like energy in a material form such as a molecule or an atom, social energy is both directed and dispersed. It becomes concentrated in a, in a certain place, yet continues to act upon the sphere outside. This means that social spaces have foundations that are at once material and formal, including con concentricity and grids, straight lines and curves, all the modalities of demarcation and orientation. Social spaces cannot be defined, however, by reducing them to their basic dualism. Rather, this dualism supplies the materials for the realization of a very great variety of projects. In natural, or later, geographical space, routes were inscribed by means of simple linear markings. Ways and tracks were pores which, without colliding, gradually widened and lengthened, leading to the establishment of places, way stations, localities made special for one reason or another, and boundaries. Through these pores, which accentuated local particularities by making use of them, flowed increasingly dense human streams. Simple herding, the seasonal movement of flocks, migrations of masses of people, and so on. These activities and spatio-temporal determinants may be said to belong to the anthropological stage of social reality. We have defined this stage as the stage of demarcation and orientation. Dominant in archaic and agricultural pastoral societies, these later became recessive and subordinate activities. There is no stage, however, at which man does not demarcate, beacon, or sign his space, leaving traces that are both symbolic and practical. Changes of direction and turns in this space always need to be represented, and he meets this figurative need either by taking his own body as a center or by reference to other bodies, celestial bodies for example, the angle of incidence of whose light serves to refine the human perception of angles in general. It should not be supposed that primitive people, seasonally migrant herders let's say, formed abstract representations of straight and curved lines of obtuse and acute angles, or even virtually, of measures. Their indicators remained purely qualitative in character, like those of animals. Different directions appeared as either benevolent or ill-omened. The indicators themselves were objects invested with effective significance, what would later be called symbolic objects. Egregious aspects of the terrain were associated perhaps with a memory, perhaps with particular actions which they facilitated. The network of paths and roads made up a space just as concrete as that of the body, of which they were in fact an extension. Directions in space and time were inhabited for such a herder, and how could it be otherwise, by real and fictitious, dangerous or lucky creatures. Thus qualified, symbolically or practically, this space bore along the myths and stories attached to it. The concrete space constituted by such networks and frontiers had more in common with a spider's web than with geometrical space. We have already noted that calculation has to reconstruct in a complicated way what nature produces in the living body and its extensions. We also know that symbolism and praxis cannot be separated. The relationships established by boundaries are certainly of the greatest importance here, along with the relationship between boundaries and named places. Thus the most significant feature of the shepherd's space might include the place, often enclosed, where he gathers his sheep the spring where he waters them, the bounds of the pasture available to him, and his neighbor's land which is off limits. Every social space then, once duly demarcated and oriented, implies a superimposition of a certain relations upon networks of named places, of lieu di. This results in, a various, in various kinds of space. 1. Accessible space for normal use, routes followed by riders or flocks, ways of leading to fields, and so on. Such use is governed prescriptively by established rules and practical procedures. 2. Boundaries and forbidden territories, spaces to which access is prohibited, either relatively, neighbors and friends, or absolutely, neighbors and enemies. 3. Places of abode, whether permanent or temporary. And 4. Junction points. These are often places of passage and encounter. Often, too, access to them is forbidden, except on certain occasions of ritual import, declarations of war or peace, for example. 
Boundaries and junction points, which are also in the nature of things points of friction, will naturally have different aspects according to the type of society, according to whether we are considering relatively settled peasants, plundering warriors, or true nomads or herders given to seasonal migrations. Social space does incorporate th one three-dimensional aspect, inherited from nature, namely the fact that between what is above, mountains, highlands, celestial beings, and what is below, in grottoes or caves, lie the surfaces of the sea and of the earth's flatlands, which thus constitute plains, or plains, that serve both to separate and to unite the heights and the depths. Here is the basis of representations of the cosmos. Similarly, caves, grottoes, hidden and underground places provide the starting point for representations of the world and myths of the earth as mother. As perceived by our shepherd, however, such oppositions as those between west and east, north and south, high and low, or before and behind, have nothing to do with abstract ideas. Rather, they are at once relationships and qualities. Space thus qualifies, in terms of time, in terms of ill-defined measures, paces, degrees of fatigue, or in terms of parts of the body, cubits, inches, feet, palms, etc. Through displacement outwards from the center, the body of the thinking and acting subject is replaced by a social subject such as a chief's hut, a pole, or, later, a temple or church. The primitive situates or speaks of space as a member of a collectivity which itself occupies a regulated space closely bound up with time. He does not envisage himself in space as one point among others in an abstract milieu. That is the type of perception belonging to a much later period, and is contemporaneous with the space of plans and maps. 8. The body serves both as a point of departure and as destination. We have already encountered this body, our body, many times in the present discussion. But what body, precisely, are we talking about? Bodies resemble each other, but the differences between them are more striking than the similarities. What is there in common between the body of a peasant leading his working ox, shackled to the soil by his plow, and the body of a splendid knight on his charger or show horse? These two bodies are as different from those of the bullock and the entire horse in whose company we find them. In either case, the animal intervenes as medium, means, instrument, or in intermediary, between man and space. The difference between the media implies an analogous difference between the two spaces in question. In short, a wheat field is a world away from a battlefield. But what conception of the body are we to adopt or readopt, discover or rediscover as our point of departure? Plato's? Aquinas's? The body that sustains the intellectus, or the body that sustains the habitus? The body as glorious, or the body as wretched? Descartes' body as object, or the body as subject of phenomenology and existentialism? A fragmented body, represented by images, by words, and traded retail? Must we start out from a discourse on the body? If so, how are we to avoid the deadly tendency of discourse towards abstraction? And if, indeed, we must begin from an abstraction, how can we limit its impact or go beyond its limitations? Should we, perhaps, rather, take off from the social body, a body battered and broken by a devastating practice, namely the division of labor and by the weight of society's demands? But how can we expect to define a critical space if we start out by accepting a body inserted into this already social space and mutilated by it? On the other hand, what basis do we have, and indeed what means, for defining this body in itself without ideology? When the body came up earlier on, on in our analysis, it did not present itself either as a subject or as an object in the philosophical sense, nor as an internal milieu standing in opposition to an external one, nor as a neutral space, nor as a mechanism occupying space partially or fragmentarily. Rather, it appeared as a spatial body, a body so conceived as produced and as the production of a space, immediately subject to the determinants of that space, symmetries, interactions, and reciprocal, reciprocal actions, axes and planes, centers and peripheries, and concrete spatio-temporal oppositions. The materiality of this body is attributable neither to a consolidation of parts of space into an apparatus, nor to a nature unaffected by space which is yet somehow able to distribute itself through space and so occupy it. Rather, the spatial body's material character derives from space, from the energy that is deployed and put to use there. Considered as a machine, the spatial body is two-sided, one side is run by massive supplies of energy from alimentary and metabolic sources, 
the other side by refined and minute energies, sense data. The question arises whether such a two-sided machine is a machine at all. To treat it as such must at the very least introduce a dialectical element into, and, that, and hence concretize, the Cartesian concept of a machine, a concept which is not only highly abstract, but also embedded in a very abstractly conceived representation of space. The notion of a two-sided machine naturally implies interaction within its bipartite structure. It embraces the possibility of unpredictable effects and rejects all strict mechanism, all hard and fast and unilateral definition. This machine's devices for the emission and reception of small-scale energies lie in the sensory organs, the afferent and efferent nerve pathways, and the brain. The organs of massive energy use are the muscles, and above all, the sexual organs, which are the pole where such energy accumulates explosively. The body's organic constitution is itself directly linked to the body's spatial constitution or organization. How could the tendencies intrinsic to this whole, the tendency to capture, withhold, and accumulate energy on the one hand, and the tendency to discharge it suddenly on the other, fail to have a conflictual relationship? The same goes for the coexisting tendencies to explore space and to invade it. The conflicts inherent in the spatio-temporal reality of this body, which is neither substance, nor entity, nor mechanism, nor flux, nor closed system, culminate in the antagonisms in human beings between knowledge and action, head and genitals, and desires and needs. As for which of these conflicts conflicts is the most or least significant, that is a value-based question which is meaningless unless one posits a hierarchy. There is no sense in doing so, however, or rather doing so in a way of losing the sense of the matter, without losing the sense of the matter, for the notion of hierarchy can only lead us into the realm of the Western Logos, into the Judeo-Christian tradition. The conflicts in question, though, do not depend solely on language, on fractured words, fractured images, or fractured places. They flow also, and indeed primarily, from an opposition constitutive of the living organism as a dialectical totality. The fact that in this organism the pole of small-scale energy, brain, nerves, senses, does not necessarily concord, in fact rather the opposite, with the massive energy pole, or sexual apparatus. The living organism has neither meaning nor existence when considered in isolation from its extensions, from the space that it reaches and produces, i.e. its milieu, to use a fashionable term that tends to reduce activity to the level of mere passive insertion into a natural material realm. Every such organism is reflected and refracted in the changes that it wreaks in its milieu or environment, in other words, in its space. At times, the body which we have yet to explore gets covered up, concealed from view, but then it reemerges. Then it is as if we were resuscitated. Does this suggest a connection between the history of the body and the history of space? With its warts plainly visible, but also its strengths and triumphs, the body here conceived is not susceptible to the simple and in fact crude and ideological distinction between normal and abnormal states, between health and pathology. In what is conventionally referred to as nature, where the fundamental rule is fertilization, is any discrimination made between pleasure and pain? Not in the obvious way, certainly. One is tempted to say, rather, that such a distinction is in fact the work of, a, the great work even, of humanity, a work often diverted and misdirected, but one that enlists the contributions of learning and art. A heavy price attaches, however, to the attainment of this goal, for once effected, this disassociation entails the separation of things that cannot or must not be separated. Let us return, however, to our inventory of what the body has to give. Tangible space possesses, although these words are not ideal here, a basis or foundation, a ground or background in the olfactory realm. If sensual rapture and its antithesis exist anywhere, if there is any sphere where, as a philosopher might say, an intimacy occurs between the subject and object, it must surely be the world of smells and the places where they reside. Quote, Next step in, they're plunged into some rot, some stump of a dwarf birch, bark rubbed ass of a raw by tail of bear or moose of caribou antlers eight years ago. Into the open mouth of that remaining stump came the years of snow, sun, little jewels of bird shit, cries of sap from the di long dying roots, the monomaniacal yodeling of insects, and wood rotting into rotting wood, 
into gestures of wood, into powder and punk all wet and stinking with fracture between earth and sky. Yeah, DJ could smell the break, gangrene in the wood, electric rot cleaner than meat and shit, sick smell and red hot blood of your blood and putrefaction, but in confirmed wood gangrene nonetheless. Burbank, a chaos of odor in the banks of the wound. Nothing smells worse than half-life, life which has no life but don't know it. Thank you, Mr. Philosopher. End quote. That's Norman Mailer, Why Are We in Vietnam, 1967. Such overwhelming and villainous smells are made up for in nature by their counterparts, by aromas and fragrances of all kinds, by the miraculous sense of flowers and by the odors of the flesh. It may be asked whether or not there is any point in dwelling on this space, which is in any case fast disappearing under the current onslaught of hygiene and, ante and asepticism. Is Hall perhaps right to assert that these are strictly anthropological or culturally determined phenomena? Should the distaste unquestionably felt by some modern quote-unquote people for natural odors be dismissed as the cause or perhaps the effect of the detergent industry? The search for answers to such questions may as well be left to the cultural anthropologists. For our purposes, the pertinent fact is that everywhere in the modern world, smells are being eliminated. What is shown by this immense deodorizing campaign, which makes use of every available means to combat natural smells, whether good or bad, is that the transposition of everything into the idiom of images, of spectacle, of verbal discourse, and of writing and reading is but one aspect of a much vaster enterprise. Anyone who is wont, and every child falls immediately into this category, to identify places, people, and things by their smells, is unlikely to be very susceptible to rhetoric. Transitional objects to which desire becomes attached in seeking to escape subjectivity and reach out to the other is founded primarily on the olfactory sense. This is true also for the erotic object in general. Smells are not decodable, nor can they be inventoried, for no inventory of them can have either a beginning or an end. They inform only about the most fundamental realities, about life and death, and they are part of no significant dichotomies except perhaps that between life beginning and life ending. There is no pathway here other than the direct one between the receiving center and the perimeter of its range, no pathway other than the nose and the scent themselves. Somewhere between information and the direct simulation of a brutal response, the sense of smell had its glory days when animality still predominated over culture, rationality, and education. Before these factors, combined with a thoroughly cleansed space, brought about the complete atrophy of smell. One can't help feeling, though, that to carry around an atrophied organ which still claims its due must be somewhat pathogenic. The Rose of Angela Silesius, which does not know that it is a flower, nor that it is beautiful, is also ignorant of the fact that it exudes a delightful scent. Though already threatened with extinction by the fruit, it unhesitatingly proffers its transient splendor. This act of self-display corresponds, however, to an unconscious nature, striving and intent to the interplay of life and death. Odors which bespeak nature's violence and largesse do not signify they are, and they say what is what they are in all its immediacy, the intense particularity of what occupies a certain space and spreads outward from that space into the surroundings. Nature's smells, be they foul or fragrant to us, are expressive. Industrial production, which often smells bad, also produces perfumes. The aim is that these should be signifiers, and to this end words, advertising copy, link signifieds to them, women, freshness, nature, glamour, and so forth. But a perfume either induces or fails to induce an erotic mood. It does not carry on a discourse about it. It either fills a place with enchantment or else has no effect at all. Tastes are hard to distinguish both from smells and from the tactile sensations of lips and tongue. They do differ from smells, however, in that they tend to form pairs of opposites. Sweet versus bitter, salty versus sugary, and so on. They are susceptible of coding and of being produced according to a particular code. Witness the way a cookery book can lay down practical rules for their creation. At the same time, tastes cannot constitute messages, and their subjection to coding adds a determination that they do not possess in themselves. Sweet does not contain a reference to bitter, the elusive charm of the bitter sweet notwithstanding. Sweet as opposed to sour as well as to bitter, although sourness and bitterness are not the same thing. Here it is a social practice that separates what in nature is given together. This is a practice which seeks to produce pleasure. 
Opposing tastes only come into their own when they occur in conjunction with other attributes. Cold and hot, crispy and soft, smooth and rough, attributes related to the sense of touch. Thus, from that social practice known as cookery, from the arts of heating, chilling, boiling, preserving, and roasting, there emerges a reality invested with meaning, which may properly be called human, even though humanism rarely alludes to it. Traditional humanism, like its modern opposite, sets little store by pleasure, both being content to remain on the level of words. Meanwhile, at the body's center is a kernel resistant to such efforts to reduce it, a something which is not truly differential, but which is nevertheless neither irrelevant nor completely undifferentiated. It is within this primitive space that the intimate link persists between smells and tastes. A philosopher might speak eloquently in this connection of a coextensive presence of space and ego thanks to the mediation of the body, but in fact a good deal more, and indeed something quite different, is involved here. For the spatial body, becoming social does not mean being inserted into some pre-existing world. This body produces and reproduces, and it perceives what it reproduces or produ and it perceives what it reproduces or produces. Its spatial properties and determinants are contained within it. In what sense, then, does it perceive them? In the practico-sensory realm, the perception of right and left must be projected and imprinted into or onto things. Pairs of determinants, axes versus points of a compass, direction versus orientation, symmetry versus asymmetry, must be introduced into space, which is to say, produced in space. The preconditions and principles of the lateralization of space lie within the body, and yet this must still be affected in such a way that right and left or up and down are indicated or marked, and choices thus offered to gesture and action. According to Timidus, the hearing plays a decisive role in the lateralization of perceived space. Space is listened for, in fact, as much as seen or heard before it comes into view. The perceptions of one ear differ from those of the other. This difference puts the child on alert and lends volume and physical density to the messages it receives. The hearing thus plays a mediating role between the spatial body and the localization of bodies inside it. The organic space of the ear, which is brought into being through the child's relationship with its mother, is thus extended to sounds from beyond the sphere of that relationship, to other people's voices, for example. Hearing disturbances, likewise, are accompanied by disturbances in lateralization to the perception of both external and internal space, dyslexias, etc. A homogeneous and utterly simultaneous space would be strictly imperceptible. It would lack the conflictual component, always resolved but always at least suggested of the contrast between symmetry and asymmetry. It may as well be noted at this juncture that the architectural and urbanistic space of modernity tends precisely towards this homogeneous state of affairs, towards a place of confusion and fusion between geometrical and visual, which inspires a kind of physical discomfort. Everything is alike. Localization and lateralization are no more. Signifier and signified, marks and markers, are added after the fact, as decoration, so to speak. This reinforces, if possible, the feeling of desertedness and adds to the malaise. This modern space has an analogical affinity with the spaces of philosophical and more specifically the Cartesian tradition. Unfortunately, it is also the space of blank sheets of paper, drawing boards, plans, sections, elevations, scale models, geometrical projections, and the like. Substituting a verbal, semantic, or semiological space for such a space only aggravates its shortcomings. A narrow and desiccated rationality of this kind overlooks the core and foundation of space, the total body, the brain, gestures, and so forth. It forgets that space does not consist in the projection of an intellectual representation, does not arise from the visible readable realm, but that it is first of all heard, listened to, and enacted through physical gestures and movements. A theory of information that assimilates the brain to an apparatus for receiving messages puts that organ's particular physiology and its particular role in the body in brackets. Taken in conjunction with the body, viewed in its body, the brain is much more than a recording machine or a decoding mechanism. Not, to be it said, that it is merely a desiring machine, either. The total body constitutes and produces the space in which messages, codes, and the coded and decoded, so many choices to be made, will subsequently emerge. 
the way for physical space, for the practico-sensory realm, to restore or reconstitute itself, is therefore by struggling against the ex post facto projections of an accomplished intellect, against the reductionism to which knowledge is prone. Successfully waged, this struggle would overturn the absolute truth and the realm of sovereign transparency, and rehabilitate underground, lateral, labyrinthine, even uterine or feminine realities. An uprising of the body, in short, against the signs of non-body. The history of the body in its final phase of Western culture is that of its rebellions. That's from Octavio Paz, Conjunciones. Indeed, the fleshly spatio-temporal body is already in revolt. This revolt, however, must not be understood as a harking back to, or to the origins, to some archaic or anthropological past. It is firmly anchored in the here and now, and the body in question is ours, our body, which is disdained, absorbed, and broken into pieces by images, worse than disdained, ignored. This is not a political rebellion, a substitute for social revolution, nor is it a revolt of thought, a revolt of the individual, or a revolt of freedom. It is an in elemental and worldwide revolt, which does not seek a theoretical foundation, but rather seeks by theoretical means to rediscover and recognize its own foundations. Above all, it asks theory to stop barring its way in this, to stop helping conceal the underpinnings that it is at pains to uncover. Its exploratory activity is not directed toward some kind of return to nature, nor is it conducted under the banner of an imagined, of an imagined spontaneity. Its object is lived experience, an experience that has been drained of all content by the mechanisms of diversion, reduction slash extrapolation, figures of speech, analogy, tautology, and so on. There can be no question but that social space is the locus of prohibition, for it is shot through with both prohibitions and their counterparts' prescriptions. This fact, however, can be most definitely not made into the basis of an overall definition, for space is not only the space of no, it is also the space of the body, and hence the space of yes, and the affirmation of life. It is not simply a matter, therefore, of a theoretical critique, but also of a turning the world upon its head, Marx and an inversion of meaning and a subversion which breaks the tablets of the law, Nietzsche. The shift, which is so hard to grasp, from the space of the body to the body in space, from opacity, warm, to translucency, cold, somehow facilitates the spiriting away or scotomization of the body. How did this magic ever become possible? And how does it continue to be possible? What is the foundation of a mechanism which thus abolishes the foundations? What forces have been able in the past, and continue to be able, to take advantage of what happens normally along the particular route which leads from the ego to the other, or more precisely, from the ego to itself via its double, the other? For the ego to appear, to manifest itself as being in my body, is that it is sufficient for it to have oriented around itself in terms of left and right, to have marked out directions relative to itself. Once a particular ego has formulated the words, my body, can it now perforce designate and locate other bodies and objects? The answer to these questions must be negative. Furthermore, the uttering of the words, my body, presupposes the ego's access to language and to a specific use of discourse. In short, it presupposes a whole history. What are the preconditions of such a history, such a use of discourse, such an intervention of language? What makes the coding of ego and alter ego and of the gap between them possible? For the ego to appear, it must appear to itself, and its body must appear to it as subtracted, and hence also extracted and abstracted from the world. Being prey to the world's vicissitudes and the potential victim of countless danger, the ego withdraws. It erects defenses to seal itself off to prevent access to itself. It sets up barriers to nature because it feels vulnerable. It aspires to invulnerability. A pipe dream? Of course, for what, are we con for what we are concerned with here is indeed magic. But is this magic performed before or after the act of denomination? Imaginary and real barriers set up against attacks from outside can be reinforced. As Wilhelm Reich showed, defensive reactions may even give rise to a tough armoring. Some non-Western cultures, however, proceed otherwise, relying upon a sophisticated discipline which places the body constantly beyond the reach of variations in its environment, safe from the onslaughts of the spatial realm. 
Such is the Eastern response to the spatio-temporal and practico-sensory body's humble demands, as opposed to the Western body's commands, which promote verbalization and the development of a hard protective shell. In some circumstances, a split occurs, and an interstice or interval is created, a very specific space which is at once magical and real. Might the unconscious not, after all, consist in an obscure nature or substantiality with, with, with which wishes and desires? Perhaps it is not a source of language, nor a language per se. Perhaps, rather, it is that very interstice, the in-between itself, along with whatever occupies it, that gains access to it and occurs therein. But if an interstice, an interstice between what and what, between self and self, between the body and its ego, or better, between the ego seeking to constitute self, between the ego seeking to constitute itself and its body, the context here is necessarily that of a long learning process, the process of formation and deformation which the immature and premature human child must undergo on the way to familial and social maturity. But what is it exactly that slips into the interstice in question? The answer is language, signs, abstraction, all necessary yet fateful, indispensable yet dangerous. This is a lethal zone, thickly strewn with dusty, moldering words. What slips into it, with what allows meaning to escape, the embrace of lived experience, to detach itself from the fleshly body. Words and signs facilitate, indeed provoke, call forth, and, at least in the West, command, metaphorizations, the transport, as it were, of the physical body outside of itself. This operation, inextricably magical and rational, sets up a strange interplay between verbal disembodiment and empirical re-embodiment, between uprooting and re-implantation, between spatialization in an abstract sense and localization in a determinate expanse. This is the mixed space, still natural yet already produced, of the first year of life and later of poetry and art, the space, in a word, of representations, representational space. 